I want to start with a question about uh, process um, and your position as a director on this work. Um, because uh, on the one hand, we see you present on screen. Uh, you definitely um, you know, conceived the idea of this project. But on the other hand, um, you uh, let things go in a way. You ask the investigator to take you on this journey of the, trying to discover Rocky II. And you also ask uh, screenwriters to try to conceive of an idea for the film. Can you uh, talk a little bit about the process and this balancing of you know, you as an artist uh, versus letting go of the work at the same time? The, the one thing that the only, the only originality of the film that is nearly not uh, visible is the process in the sense that the, 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 the challenge here was how to produce a narrative, a story, without writing anything. And so <clears throat> one of the ideas to say, we, there is many stories everywhere. You just organize to shoot everything from classical angle that you see in cinema. And, and, and by editing, you will end up with a narrative. And that was the uh, belief, and uh, and that's how we organize everything. So, the, and probably here it's it's a transposition of the way that some artworks w function, uh, in the sense that you can do work based on uh, on protocol only, and then, which is a very kind of a classic of concept conceptual attitude of saying the result doesn't matter, the process is what is important. You establish the process and then you see what's happening and you, there is no control over the, the results. So, which is fine when you do an artwork, but it's more complicated when you do a film because it's much more expensive and you have um, a, a, a team and it's, it's, it becomes a kind of very complex machinery to organize. And also you have, you need everybody to believe in that possibility. And to be honest, we, I wasn't sure it would work, uh, <clears throat> which is a risk when you spend 900,000 euro uh, and then it fails, then of course it's a bit difficult, it's complicated. So, so that's how we started. And the, the idea was to, to set up just two elements. Uh, we look for a rock. We need a detective, so I, I basically uh, casted thirty different detectives to find one, and then I, and then the idea was to, in parallel to that s physical search of the rock, I wanted to have people searching for the reason why somebody would look for the rock, and so I thought that the the. Uh, uh, the, play, the, 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 the location of the piece being in Los Angeles, I thought, what else than uh, screenwriters? So I just, I also uh, casted uh, screenwriters that didn't work together before, but they knew each other, or they knew of each other. And, uh, and that's it, that's, all, that's basically all I've done. And then I followed what they proposed me. So the the detective was saying we should uh, go there, and and then the team I had was organizing meetings and interviews, and sometimes I was helping as well. I I had some information, so I gave the information to the detective, and but that's basically how it worked. So I was as much as possible following what he proposed, and for the screenwriters, I was. Uh, here I was more controlling because writers can work from home, and here we played a little bit with the uh, landscape. Nice. Um, I was wondering if you could speak about your fascination with film. Uh, hopefully some of I you... I don't have any. Oh, yeah? <laughs> well, uh, I just visited the show this morning, and um, there, yeah. there were many uh, references to cinema, uh, in your works, I was wondering, um, yeah, did you learn anything about cinema working on this film that you weren't aware of uh, before? This connection to film is a, is an accident. In, initially, I started to wh when I was uh, when I started really doing art, I was interested in showing. Actually, there is one piece in the show that is 
right at that moment called the party. And uh, I was interested in showing that we all engage in creative uh, activities and that I, w I wanted to capture those moments where we create things without thinking about it. And one thing I was interested in was that this moment you're writing, you're searching for um, synonyms for a text. And I, I, w I realized that by looking at synonyms, I was, in a way it was a kind of zero degree of creativity, just choosing a, w a, a word. And then I extended that experience by asking a secretary to describe the sound event she could hear in headphones. I needed to have something to make the sound, and I was looking for a soundtrack that would be busy enough to keep her busy writing. And so I just took a film, and I was in, involved in many exhibitions about art and films. I was absolutely not into the film thing. It just that it was an accident, and then, after uh, why it becomes your object because you continue working with it. So I, I really don't have any fascination for film. And then when I succeeded to convince, because I also stopped doing works based on films, and I, I, I think I wrote few texts about how much my work was not specially connected to film. I think I, when just I started to convince people that my work was some, about something else, then I got the Oscar, and then I thought, okay. <laughs> so that's all I can say. And that relationship um, hasn't changed since. Uh. No, why? Well, this, of course, it did because then I did that, and I, to be honest, I, I, I had no idea I could do a, f a feature. It is a bit of a miracle, and you never know. I mean, because it's my first movie as a director. So um, after that, you, of course, you start developing ideas about films and, and so. yeah, I would love to do another one. I'm still trying to do another one, but. Uh. Nice. Um, maybe I could ask you whether, uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Sorry, I was <laughs> thinking that we can open mm -hmm. to the floor and then we continue also. Yeah, so sure. Because then maybe we might forget. So if you have any questions, yeah. you should already. Raise your hand. Uh, yeah, sorry. They will do it. Ah, yeah. Well. Yeah, here at the front. Um, it's more a question about uh, contents of the film itself and what parts are real and what parts are fake. So I was wondering uh, if you would want to reveal. Uh, if the documentary that they're using from 1979, S uh, six? six, if that was a real documentary about it, the road. It is. Okay. And actually, the, so basically, it, it some article says it's a fake documentary. It's not. My, my, my film is a fake documentary. It's not a fake documentary. It's a fake fiction in the sense that basically the idea is that if you if you do a documentary, you have to increase the documentary effect. So you handheld camera, and it's it's a bit crap, crappy, and it moves, and and it's messy, and uh, uh, and that's part of the game of doing a documentary as well. You can do documentary in different ways, and the the in, the the idea here was to hide the fact that we were doing a documentary and to make it look as if it was a fiction, which is a bit more complicated because of camera placement and how do you place camera if nobody knows exactly how it, they're going to move. And that was, I mean, we can talk about that, but that was basically the complexity of how to, to make this film. But um, the documentary from 76 is a real BBC documentary. And that's the only time I lied to the uh, detective because I knew f from from the beginning that the documentary existed, but I, I didn't tell him before London. And he was quite upset about that. But, <laughs> but we were already too far in the process. 
But also I thought a lie, you know, in all good uh, detective stories, the client is lying about something, you know? <laughs> Any other questions from the audience? Yeah, at the back? Yeah. yeah. I'll, can, you, can you hear me if I yes, yes. talk uh, loud-ish? Good, good. Um, I really enjoyed this movie very much to, uh, to start. Uh, this interesting thing to me happened. I'm kind of like, no. where you at first are drawn in by the, like the movie language, like which is a very a familiar language. Mm -hmm. But then as more elements to the story are added, your, your distance or your ex expectancies change. So as what more time, at what moment does it happen to you? Before, <laughs> <laughs> so before the screenwriters, or do you think it's connected to the screenwriters? No. Uh, I think already before the screen screenwriters, I think already with the introduction of the the, the detective. Okay. You know. mm -hmm. And so as 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 layers get at, get added, like also the the the. What you take to be a real or fictional changes all the time. So, mm -hmm. in a sense, you're also thrown back in your chair watching a movie. So it, and then you get sucked in again. It was a very interesting experience that way. You know, the the when I did I did uh, after that after I've done the film, I did uh, ten different trailers, trying to exhaust all possible ways to present the film. Also, uh, I think out of uh, frustration because th we never sold the film, so there was no distribution, therefore there was no trailers. So I thought I did 10 of them for a show. And, um, and then I realized another way to do the film that I missed, and the idea was to start with the screenwriters and see the screenwriters searching for a story and then only put the 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 the, the detective the story with the detective in that way and the trailer works really i mean you see it works and that way you would read the detective as a total fiction mm -hmm. and i i thought it was a it's a missed opportunity of a way to actually shoot reality and make it look like a fiction and the, and the other way around, like t two writers thinking about how they could write a story and that would be the fictional part. I still can do it. I think I was thinking about how to do it again and I, th I think it would be an interesting way to deal with the same idea. Uh, how to make reality look totally fictional with, at the same time, the the quality of reality, which means that they are act they are acting like no actors can do. They are ama amazing because they don't act. And by the way, when we did the editing with the with the the fictional part, it was very hard on the actors because they look so bad <laughs> in the editing t on the editing suite. It was really hard to. And then I had to work a lot to make it look a bit less uh, hard on them because the contrast between the real people and the actors w was too too much. But um, but also there are real. I mean, some of the real people are also very strong character. Like uh, uh, what's his name now? I forgot the names of my character. The <laughs> the guy who knows Ed Rusche and who. Knows oh, the rock, the uh, the so-called rock expert. Yeah, oh, I forget his name as well. Uh, Jim Genzer. Yeah, Jim Genzer. Yeah. yeah, I mean Jim Genzer and Mike White, the guy who's telling the trailer. Ju -ju -ju. I mean, you you know when you have those guys, and it was totally by accident mm -hmm. that the film is going to be better because they are amazing. I agree. Any other questions from the audience? Uh, and, and my question, yeah, please. From what you s are saying now about uh, your ideas on documentary and how to present it, 
and the movie itself reminded me a lot about the movie F for Fake. True. Yeah, I had, well, it's one of my reference, even though I didn't think of it, we didn't use this to to resolve. You know, when you when you do any kind of work, you kind of have your models, and then sometimes you use them to resolve problems, mm -hmm. which was not the case with the Orson Welles movie, but, but it's one of my reference. Um, now I was saying Mike White, with the hat, was initially one of the writers I wanted to hire uh, to write the story, but then he was not available for long enough. So I said, okay, maybe you can do a small part, and he said yes, and that's why he, he did that little part. But that was totally also unwritten. It just, I said, just go and say hi to your friend DV and just talk about whatever you want. And that's what happened. It's only one shot. All the dialogues are only one shot. So there is no, no reshoot or anything. And that was deliberate or like... Yeah, because it has to be fresh. And, yeah. and so we were shooting 50, 60 minutes of dialogue mm. with two cameras, sometimes three. And then we were just writing the dialogue in a way in by editing the film. Mm. It was very fun to do. So a dialogue that is that lasted 50 minutes be becomes three, four minutes. Mm. Yeah, question. Yeah. Um, would, you s would you say, or um, in your artist practice, would you say that you're now working more with film or more with uh, other mediums? Well, I do chocolate now. Yeah. <laughs> so no. I don't think I do. Uh, and what you have coming up? You mean the next work? I don't know yet. I'm I'm still on the chocolate. <laughs> Which is very good, by the way. I tried it today. <laughs> um, I saw a hand up there. Yeah. Yes. About the first interaction between the people in the film. So had they met before, like the detective and the rock expert? Oh. No, no. One of, that's a very good question. One of the trick was to avoid anybody to meet before shoot. Like I mean, the film. When I was describing it to friends, I was like, it's a documentary mystery, and then now I feel like it's a road movie. <laughs> so like more than the aspect of like reality and fiction, I felt like you really move across like movie genres. That's, I think, what's so beautiful about it. But then one of the key points that really stuck with me were like the first moments of interactions between all of these. And they felt so genuine. And I think also the because entry on the screens were, you know, the music came up and then he would turn around and it's like, mm. and I didn't know if that was staged or real. Like Which one? I don't remember, but there were a few of these. Yeah, yeah. no, it's uh, it's totally on stage. So, as I said, the trick was to find a way to. Alors, there is one time. Uh, that's another time where the, uh, when the detective was unhappy, um, <laughs> we were looking for. Uh, I forgot his name again. The surfer. Uh, get Jim, Jim can Thank you. Uh, and we were so he located Jim Ganser, but he couldn't really find the uh, address. And so me and my uh, line, the line producer, we searched on our side as well, and we went uh, on the hill where he lived, and uh, we knock at the door, and it was somebody else, uh, because the GPS was giving us the wrong address. So the lady who was a lawyer said, no, Jim is living up there. And uh, so we go there, and he was there. And, uh, and, he, and I explained the situation. I explained that I was doing the film. And I said, we would like to shoot uh, at your place. But uh, I cannot tell you anything uh, about it. And he said, yes, because he's very cool and relaxed. So when the next week, when or the next day, when uh, 
we shoot the scene with a detective. He also does the GPS. And exactly the same thing happened. He goes to the wrong house. That's, w that's what you see in the film. And I knew it would not be the right house, but I didn't say anything. And I didn't know it would be the cleaning lady. So that was all very nice. And I'm lucky that we pick up on her voice because she was not mic'd up. So it's the microphone of the detective that pick up her voice. So total luck. And <clears throat> then he, he cannot find the address. And he tells me, OK, I have to go back to my office to search for the right address. And I was like, damn. <laughs> so I said, why don't we ask around other people in the house? We have, because w when you move a team, you need to, the, you cannot stop the day shooting like that. So I said, we need to, we need to shoot more. And then tonight, you will go back to your office. And so eventually, he went to ask uh, to uh, Jim's house. And then eventually, he realized it was Jim's house. So I was, and then he, then he heard, because Jim told him that we've, we've been at his place two days before. And he was really upset. But so there was a bit of manipulation. But, but because otherwise, it would have been impossible. But, uh, but basically, the trick was really not to say anything to anybody. And same with, uh, with uh, Michael Govan, the director of the uh, museum. Uh, I don't think he even knew it was a, he would be uh, asked question by a detective. So but really to keep everything as fresh as possible. And I think that's what makes the film enjoyable to watch is because you have micro reaction things that are totally spontaneous. I think it was the scene of the park I just remembered when he's meeting the, the rock expert and there's a lot of people, and he's wondering if it's that person sitting in the Ah, yes, right, yeah. right. True, true. Oh, that was a tricky one. Oh, I forgot that. Yeah, of course. The, the, the British guy, the filmmaker. No, that's a director from England. True. I saw a hand at the back, yeah. Um, on that sound, the music choices that you made, the music choices that you made were fascinating to me um, in terms of being part of what you were trying to say about Hollywood. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the music and, and yeah. how you thought of that in the film, because it worked so well with what you were trying to do in the film to me. So, mm -hmm. the, Actually, it's interesting because my first love is music, actually. If I had to redo, if I had to change something in my life, I would just become a musician or a composer. Um, do you know which instrument or no but i think a composer rather so uh, and so music was an important part of the film because i knew that would make the film become a fiction uh, and uh, the, actually there is a huge amount of music in the film i think we have 50 minutes of music which is a lot and um even though I, I w Star Wars movies, it's endless movie and en endless music. No silence. Just dialogues. The music goes low, and then it's uh, it's really funny. And so um, I worked. I found this uh, um, the I found this composer from. Uh, it's a Swiss guy who lived in Belgium, and uh, we got on well together. And he and. and uh, he was very uh, flexible, so he let me. Basically, we had a little, uh, a little uh, 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 habit, which was I was going there at his place in the morning with my bass because I play bass, and we were looking for some phrase and 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 themes that would be usable, and. Uh, and then uh, the next day, he would make me listen to what he found. And, and we started working like that. And then what happened is that we composed, he composed uh, a pretty good piece for the first part of the movie. And I, because we were running out of time, the, the whole film was done. Uh, with a lot of uh, delays, and we, we were lacking a lot of time for making the music. And then I said, why don't we keep that section of music? We just 
uh, reorchestrate it in a different way, and I will do the editing of the film according to the music. So the second part of the movie is exactly the same musical part than the first period, but but just uh, transposed. Actually, the reason how I knew it would work is because you know when you work on the computer. I don't know if you you, if you all know that uh, the music is just sections of uh, of colors, and then you can move them along the timeline, and. One day when I was editing alone, I moved something out. I moved the music out on the right. And by playing, by accident, playing the movie, I realized that it would work on another sequence. So that's how it happened. And then I said, we don't have time to rewrite, to write more music. We have to use exactly the same sequence. And then I will, I will do the cutting according to the music. And that's how we did. So the music was a very important part. And so he wrote one part that is used twice and then he wrote the the musical the the musical uh, piece where nobody's talking it's just the the two writers and and so that's how it worked so we just have a few minutes left okay so i thought i'd uh, take the last question or so yeah <laughs> yeah please, please, please. <laughs> if that's all right um i was checking out uh, ed Ruscha's website today um, and I noticed, um, I've never seen this on an artist's website before, but there's a sec tab called works and another tab right next to it called missing works, which is no, but he's famous for that. Yeah. Yeah. 23 pages long, lots of, lots exactly. of missing works and, uh, Rocky two is not in there. So. No, because, because <laughs> it's, uh, it's in it's behind his house. I see. Yeah, so yeah. when, when, when Jim Ganser says he found the rock, it's true. He found the rock. But when we got there, uh, the detective explained to the team that this uh, gate could not be crossed, and uh, so I and I didn't go. I wanted to show to the team that if I don't go, nobody should go. So Jim is the only one who saw the rock, and uh, uh, I know. Yes, I was told that. Who, who told me that? The detective, I think, told me that he went back the night after that because he wanted to see the rock. <laughs> and so uh, he went by night with a flashlight. Can you believe it? <laughs> <laughs> or maybe it went the night before. I forgot. There is a story. Because he was so upset that I lied twice <laughs> that I think he went the night before. I should. I forgot the story exactly, but I know he went there. So Jim and the detective probably are the two only people with Ed Rouché who knows who have seen the rock. And I think what I understood is that this uh, this desert gravel that he did put on it, it's totally gone. So it's purely like a transparent shell. We have a quick minute. Maybe you, you said you're working on a, another film. Is that something you can share with <coughs> us already? What the I idea did, is? I, I've met some years ago a, f a, v a very famous uh, screenwriter called Jean-Claude Carrière, who, who worked for uh, Louis Buniel for the uh, seven last films he did. And so um, I interviewed him because I was interested. And then by in the interview, he revealed that they wrote two scripts that n that was never produced. And I I bought the rights for one, and then it was too complicated. And then I, I swapped for the other one. That was an adaptation of uh, Carl Luis Mans. And, uh, and I, we rewrote the script to adapt it to a more contemporary situation. And, and then he died uh, a few months after we finished uh, working on it. And uh, I'm still in the process of looking for a producer who would be interested. It's not, it's not easy at the moment because it's not a blockbuster, to be honest. And, uh, and the cinema is in crisis, as in case you don't know. So we will see. But that's what, that's what I'm doing now with, uh, with the film. I very much hope it. It gets made and we get to see it, yeah. I hope so too. I don't know actually, you know, you never know because <laughs> sometimes it's better not to do things 
It's a, it's, <laughs> so I don't push. If it happens, I will do it. Yeah. But uh, we'll see. And maybe another artist will make a, a project about this missing work exactly. of yours. Yeah. Well, thank you very much, Pierre. And uh, thank, thank you, you very, very much, much and, uh, for your questions.